Well, thanks to all of you for leading us to uh, this point in our worship experience. Uh, I will not be before you long, and I know uh, folks who get up in front of a mic say that often, and then uh, you know it's going to be long. Uh, <laughs> this morning, that is unlikely to happen. Uh, I will not be long, but uh, I do believe uh, that I have just a simple reminder for the church this morning to be thankful. And so we will turn to the scriptures together. Our scripture reading this morning will be from the book of Matthew, chapter 25, verses 14 to verse 30. In Matthew chapter 25, verses 14 through verse 30, uh, a relatively familiar passage of, of Scripture. I, I, I told my wife I was uh, using this text, uh, and she said, oh, well, Troy, you probably have the, the, the table set up outside so people can sign up for a ministry. Um, she was joking with me because that happened uh, at a church we attended, and it was awesome. But that is not what we're doing this morning. The tables aren't set up. Um, but our directors and coordinators are here, um, and uh, you do have the opportunity to serve. Amen. Uh, but let's stand in reverence of the Word of God. We'll read Matthew chapter 25, verses 14 through 30. Again, it will be like a man going on a journey who called his servants and entrusted his wealth to them. To one he gave five bags of gold to another two bags, and to another one bag, each according to his ability. Then he went on his journey. The man who had received five bags of gold went at once and put his money to work and gained five bags more. So also the one with two bags of gold gained two more. But the man who had received one bag went off, dug a hole in the ground, and hid his master's money. After a long time, the master of those servants returned and settled accounts with them. The man who had received five bags of gold brought the other five. Master, he said, you entrusted me with five bags of gold. See, I have gained five more. His master replied, well done, good and faithful servant. You have been faithful with a few things. I will put you in charge of many things. Come and share your master's happiness. The man with two bags of gold also came. Master, he said, you entrusted me with two bags of gold. See, I have gained two more. His master replied, Well done, good and faithful servant. You have been faithful with a few things. I will put you in charge of many things. Come and share your master's happiness. Then the man who had received one bag of gold came. Master, he said, I knew that you are a hard man, harvesting where you have not sown and gathering where you have not scattered seed. So I was afraid and went out and hid your gold in the ground. See, here is what belongs to you. His master replied, You wicked, lazy servant, so you knew that I harvest where I have not sown and gather where I have not scattered seed? Well then, you should have put my money on deposit with the bankers, so that when I returned, I would have received it back with interest. So take the bag of gold from him and give it to the one who has ten bags. For whoever has will be given more, and they will have in abundance. Whoever does not have, even what they have, will be taken from them. And throw that worthless servant outside into the darkness, where there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. The word of God for the people of God. You may be seated. Let us pray. Lord, in this preaching moment, I... Simply pray that you would speak directly to the hearts of your people. And Lord God, that you would remind us of your greatness and your presence and your being in our lives. Lord, I pray that we would see you clearly enough to be continually thankful and to be transformed in your name. Amen. And praise God. Well, I picked the New International Version of the scripture to read this morning, and so it said bags of gold. Uh, but many of you know this scripture with the word talents replacing bag of gold. 
And the idea that you often hear when this scripture is preached is simply that we are given different amounts of talents uh, and that we are to use our talents for God. And that instead of taking our talents and hiding them in a hole, we should take our talents and put them in a place where they might bear fruit. And it works really well, right? Because when you think about the word talent as money, you hear also the fact that it's not just about money, but it's about our talent, about our ability, about what God has placed inside of us. And so the, the, the talent, uh, or the one bag of gold, if you please, is a lot of, of money. I don't have the exact calculation, admittedly, um, but the sources that I read suggest that a talent is around the amount of 16 to 20 years of wages for uh, a laborer. Uh, I've done the math before. I'm going to let you go ahead and do it on your own. Let's just say, depending on your, your, your hourly rate, if you please, for a laborer, you're somewhere between 500000 and $1.5 million for one talent. In other words, the amount of money uh, is a lot of money. And if we equate this idea of gold or talent with the, with the idea that we have talents, we could argue that we're talking about between 500000 or $1.5 million worth of talent. But the truth is that the talent that God has placed inside of us is priceless. Amen. We are fearfully and wonderfully made. And I've heard this preached before uh, about this idea that we can take our talents and turn them over to God and church. That is so incredibly important that it is, in some senses, the real truth of one of the three pillars that victory is based on. This idea that we can know God uh, and that we can live in fullness as we turn what God has given to us over in service to the Lord. But this morning I want to turn from that for a moment to ask us to consider what it means to be thankful. What it means to be thankful and who we are thankful to. In the parable this morning, three individuals were given stewardship over funds of the master, and two of them took those funds and used them in order to create additional value. And one person took what they were given and stuck it in a hole so that it would never be diminished. When we think about the one who is given one talent and put it in a hole, we have to wonder why he did that. In fact, if we are honest, we might consider the fact that that's what we might do. That we might take what we are given and ensure that it is protected so that it will exist in its current form for all of time. Where we can take what we are given and hold on to it. And you might argue, in fact, I have before, as you read this text, that that is what we should do. That if we are given something that we should protect it, that we should hold it, that we should protect it from everything so that it is retained when the master comes back. Look, master, you entrusted me with this, this money. And when you came back, I gave you the money. <laughs> Look, friend, you entrusted me with your car when you went away. Uh, and you came back six months later, and look, your car is in the sh same shape. It is in pristine 
condition. I didn't go out and use the car and to try and, and, and develop things and get more. No, I honored what you provided for me by ensuring that it was taken care of. It's a reasonable way to think. But what the word tells us is that this man who received between 500000 and $1.5 million dollars Right. knew that the master was a hard man, harvesting where he has not sown and gathering where he has not scattered. So out of fear, he went and hid his talent in the ground. And so the question here, church, is what do we think about the master. What do you think about the master? And how does it affect what you do with the goodness that the master gives you to have stewardship over? This text is tailored to teach us that amongst reasonable possibilities, we might think about taking what the Master has given us and not assuming that the Master is shrewd and hard, but instead assuming that the fact that the Master has given to us tells us that the Master is a giver. That in the words of Mircea Volf, the theologian, that the master is the one who gives us all things. And the lesson perhaps in this text here today is that we can see our God as the giver of all things and not as the hard man who is requiring from us. That God is the source of everything that we have. And we do not need to live in a bushel. That we do not need to take what the master has given us and put it in somewhere where there's no light. But instead, as the song says, we need to take what the master has given us and let this little light shine. That we need to take what the master has given us and allow it to be used in this world for the master's glory that, oh, if I got five bags of gold, that master, I know that it takes a little bit of risk out of me to take that gold and to, to go beyond what you've given me and to step out on faith. But when you come back, master, look, you gave me five bags of gold and look, there's five more. I trusted beyond my flesh telling me to retain and because I did what you have provided has been multiplied. Amen. I've taken what you've given me and I've understood it as a gift from you and I've said thank you for that gift and in that thanksgiving and with the attitude of gratitude as as Dr. Wheelock preached last week with an attitude of gratitude. I've taken your gift as the giver and said, I too will take the risk of giving because I see you, God, not as the hard man who will punish me, but as the one who is continually giving and has more for me. Church, I believe that God has great things for his people. I know some folks call me naive. I know it doesn't always look that way or feel that way. But all good things come from God. All good things come from the Lord. He is the very source of everything. And it's to him that we give thanks as uh, the theologian Wolf said, to live in sync with who we truly are means to recognize that we are dependent on God for our very breath 
and are graced with many good things. God is the giver in a material sense. He is the ground of being. All good things come from God and we are fully dependent upon God for all that we are. And our response to that is to be thankful that God has given it, to be thankful that God has provided, to be thankful that God has given us bags of gold, given us talent in order to use in our lives. Amen. It's interesting, the man who had one talent had one talent. Uh, the other folks in the story Jesus told had a lot more. Right? And so this man with one talent could look at his situation and say, the one with two talents, they can risk it. Right? The one with three talents, the one with four talents, the one with 500 talents, they can go ahead and risk it. But I've only got one talent, so I need to bury this talent, because if I lose this talent, I have nothing. But I want to point out for a moment to remind us once again that even one talent is a lot of money to have stewardship over. And if you have stewardship over one talent uh, of the master's money, then I can guarantee you that you are rich. Now, are you rich compared to the one with a thousand talents or a hundred thousand talents? Maybe not. But in an absolute sense, you are rich. You are rich in the sense that you don't necessarily realize that you have to rely upon something or someone else for your basic material needs. You don't walk around every day feeling that and knowing that truth. And so it's easy to forget it. It's easy to say that I can rely upon myself. It's easy to say that I have to hold on to this talent because otherwise I am in a difficult place. I'm, I'm conjecturing now, but I wonder if that's why God tells us that it's easier for a camel to go through the eye of a needle than for a rich man to inherit eternal life. Because there is this notion when we are in lack that we must recognize the source of our life and we must give thanks to that source. And that if we have a talent, we might instead rely upon that talent, upon those funds, instead of relying upon the ground of our being. We might say thank you to the wrong things and the wrong folks. We might forget the language of thank you. We might not realize that we need to say thank you to God. I, I, I am blessed because I am, uh, I am a, a, a rich man. I, I, I recognize it. Uh, in the context of the world, I suspect that we are all rich people in here. I'm not, I'm not going to say that with certainty. Uh, I just highly suspect it. So if you walk around thinking that you are not rich, I want to remind you that you very well may be a miracle. You very well may be a camel going through the eye of a needle. And, 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 and the, that miracle, right, the, the infinitesimally small chance of a camel going through the head of a needle, the, 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 the impossibility of it, and I know there's some, some physicists in here who might be able to calculate that out, but it's, it, it, it's so impossible that the limit approaches zero. That is the same mathematical formula as the opportunity 
for us to know God, for us to recognize that our foundations are upon God, for us to know and be thankful to God for every breath that we take, for everything that we do. It is that same mathematical calculation that says it is impossible for us to go through the head of a needle but with God, all things are possible. And the giver of life, the one who gives us the talents, does come and say, yes, I have made the impossible possible for you so that you can walk in the fullness of truth. Can you believe that you are that impossible? Can you believe that God has allowed us uh, in some senses, to worship in this beautiful edifice, uh, and yet to still know that we need to rely upon him and give thanks to God in all things. Do you know and consider how impossible that is? But God Amen. allowed us to know him. But God allows us to have the opportunity to say thank you. But God allows us to have brothers and sisters in Christ who, who, when we don't understand that truth, can say, Troy, everything, and I mean everything, that you have is a gift from God and is literally based on what God is doing. Church, we're called this month to recognize and be thankful for what God is doing. God has indeed called us to live into the fullness of his grace and his mercy and to live in ways that open up our hands to the possibility that because everything that we are and everything that we do comes from God, we can live in a thankful and joyful and abundant fullness. Recognizing that God isn't some hard man in the in the sky that is looking to catch us up and uh, and and catch us uh, messing up his money and throw us into debtor's jail, but instead God uh, wants to shine His light in us in a way that allows us to be thankful for what God is doing and to share that thanks to the entire world to take our talent, to take our money, to take everything that God has placed inside of us and to multiply. God has called us to be thankful to him and to bless his holy name. God has called us to walk around as a people who know that God is the source of our strength and the strength of our life. God has called us to love him at all times and to live and to operate in that love. God has called us to be rooted in thankfulness and to take the step to say that I can take what God has given me and I can step out on faith because I know all good things come from God and I trust God. God has called us to be able to say that, yes, Lord, I trust you. God has called us to be able to say, yes, Lord, I am thankful. Even in November every year, we're reminded of Thanksgiving. And yes, we do say thank you, Lord. Church, yes, we do say thank you for the one who gives and who provides. Thank you to the God who loved us so much that he did not hold back his son, but gave his son so that we might have truth and life in this world and we might be reconciled to him. Thanks be to God, because God has indeed been so good. To God be the glory for the great things that he is doing. And we are thankful. And where... Our vision of God tells us to hide what he has given us. Where our vision of God 
tells us to hide. I call you victory. To look to your left and to your right and to see a people blessed by God and then to look to yourself and know in the very same way God has blessed and called you and that he trusts you with what is most precious, what is priceless. He trusts you with himself. Amen. And praise God. Well, church, the gospel has been preached in your hearing. And we have an opportunity to respond to God. The truth, as I just said, is that Jesus loved you enough that while you were yet separated from him, he died for you. If you haven't accepted that truth yet, this is an opportunity to publicly do it. So as is our current custom with every head bowed and every eye closed, if you haven't accepted Jesus Christ and the fact that he is the way that the Father has come to say, yes, come to me and I will forgive your sin. Go ahead and slip your hand into the air. God is always calling. He calls through creation. He calls through his church. He even calls through you. If you're hearing that call right now, go ahead and slip your hand into the air. Amen. If you're, if, you're, if you're accepting that, slip that hand up high so I can make, make sure I see it. Amen. I see that hand. I see that hand. Amen. 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 Is there another? Amen. My, my sister, I will connect with you just after, just after church. Church, go ahead and open your eyes. Let's give God a hand clap of praise for the one who accepted. Amen. Church, church, we're, 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 new, we're in here. I know we're all messed up. But right now, heaven is rejoicing. So uh, there ain't no party left of the party in heaven. So we can participate. Let's go ahead and celebrate what God is doing. Amen.